As Dr. Voravi has introduced me, I'm Dean Associate, Professor of Leadership Management and Researcher at Monarch Business School, Switzerland. As a next generation leader, I'm the CEO of KO Sci-Fi Branding, an international branding consultancy company, president of the Elite Group. This is a hospitality business, author, speaker, and executive consultant. And I do aim to be a transformative scholar across multiple fields and disciplines, a devoted dean, an influential professor, an impactful consultant, and a tireless advocate for the future generations through my speeches, publications, interviews, and works. And today we are going to talk about leadership. And I have always been interested in leadership and have studied the lives of the great leaders across history, as well as the different theories of leadership. All my life, in various capacities, I had to assume leadership roles, whether in my business or in my family. And following the thinking of who you surround yourself with is who you become, I have tried to surround myself with great people, most of whom are community or business leaders. In building my knowledge of leadership, leaders and the act of leading, I have met from presidents, philanthropists and professionals to highly motivated people who lead without a title and those who lead families. These experiences made me understand that leading is a process that can be ignited in all of us. And one of the toughest organizations to lead is the entrepreneurial organizations. Entrepreneurs have to constantly adapt to the winds and they usually have to make do with very scarce resources. They don't have a blueprint for success and they're often the only ones who see the end result. Entrepreneurs are leaders who face adversity every single day. So in our time together today, I would like to introduce to you leadership theory and to familiarize you with the main dilemmas and themes that we consider when teaching leadership. So our objectives for today are to identify the importance of leadership, to recognize the main debates in leadership theory, to distinguish between leaders and followers, to compare between leaders and managers, and to apply self-leadership to a personal or professional context. This is not a one-way conversation, so at some point I may ask you to reflect on a specific topic or to share your thoughts with the group. There are no right or wrong answers, but rather opportunities for us to learn from each other. Also, at the end, we will make some time for specific questions, which I will try to answer for you the best that I can. And before we dive into why is leadership important, I would like to ask you, why does everyone seem to want to be a leader? Why do you think that is? Can you think why you or someone you know would want to be a leader? I would like to be a leader based on the fact that um, I would like to direct people to do the right thing. And um, also leading, it's, um, it's a way I think like um, you need to put people on the right direction and um, also um, give them like um, create good examples and um, they could follow your examples you've, you've created. Right, thank you. So you want to direct people and to be an example for others. Yes. Okay, and can you think of why you wouldn't want to be a leader? These are some positives of being a leader, but can you think of what are some negatives of being a leader? Um, some negative um, things of um, being a leader is um, you always have to show a good example. You don't need to um, go off the line. Like um, sometimes probably you want to do something for yourself. Like uh, you keep looking like, um, am I doing something? I hear you well. You, you'll be like, um, are you doing something right? Or um, are you getting something wrong? You're always very cautious about yourself sometimes when you're a leader. So I think it's, it's a kind of disadvantage. But if you're not a leader, you're not cautious about those things because you feel like if you make a mistake, um, your leader can definitely correct you. But as a leader, you need to try. Uh, definitely you, you make mistakes as a leader. But 
um, you always need to try not to make like um, too much mistakes because people are relating from what you're doing. I agree very much with what you said. People are relying on you and you have to face constant change in everything you do. So why is leadership important for future entrepreneurs? If you or anyone else wants to try and answer that question. So, um, I think um, it's important for future entrepreneurs because Definitely, um, if, you, if you own a company, you have to um, manage that company and show good example. For example, like um, I do like um, a YouTube um, videos and I have like a few people who, who works with me, who work with me, right? So definitely, um, I need to show them some um, good example, punctuality and um, like organizing also, because if I'm not able to do this, definitely, um, they're going to see um, some some laps some lapses and they won't be able to uh, I won't be able to tell them okay you're doing this wrong or you're doing this right because I'm not showing a good example. So as an entrepreneur, you need to you need to make sure you're able to uh, um, create a good example and uh, for your for your followers. So to be a good example for your followers, and that is how you create entrepreneurship. Uh, so I, you are an entrepreneur, a YouTube entrepreneur. I'm wondering if anyone else in the class is also an entrepreneur. Can we just have a raise of hands of everyone who is an entrepreneur in the class? Raise of hands. Can you keep those hands up for like 10 seconds? Okay, so we have a few entrepreneurs in the class. Okay, hands down. And who wants to be an entrepreneur? Who wants to be an entrepreneur? Okay. Good. So we have a class full of people who are either entrepreneurs or who want to be an entrepreneur. Can someone else who's already in an entrepreneurial capacity come and share with us why as an entrepreneur we also want to be a leader? Can everyone else other than the colleague that is now seating in front of us? Entrepreneurs want to be a leader uh, uh, is because uh, as an entrepreneur, you definitely have to lead others. And since an entrepreneur is a person who have to bring ideas, um, create unique uh, um, ideas for people, so you, you also need to know how to lead because if not, th those ideas is not going to work out. Um, so it's important that. Uh, an entrepreneur should be a leader as well. So this is going to help uh, help uh, the person to be able to carry out those ideas he or she has um, to bring out. So to implement, we want to be leaders as entrepreneurs because we want to implement new ideas, ideas that don't exist, ideas that change the status quo. And why would we not want to be leaders as entrepreneurs? Um, well, uh, I don't think most people who are entrepreneurs don't want to be leaders, but if there is, uh, maybe they do not want to do the act themselves, because you know we have so many kinds of leadership, so, so many types of leadership, so maybe they don't want to show the people how to do it, because for me, I believe that leaders should show how to do it, not the other way around. So maybe they do not want to show the people how to do it. Maybe that's why they don't want to be leaders or they do not want to take the responsibility itself. They would like to pass on the responsibility to another person. So maybe that's why they, they decide not to be uh, a leader. 
You're right, so many people don't want to assume that responsibility or they don't know how to show another person to work with them and to develop them. Um, thank you for that. What was your name? Chama. Chama, thank you. Um, from now on, when you come uh, to the microphone, if you could just please state your name because I would like to know who I'm talking to. That would be great. Thank you for that. So, as we've heard your colleagues say, and Chama has very well put this, she doesn't know many entrepreneurs who don't want to be leaders because there's this fascination with leaders, right? From the ancients, Aristotle, to Sun Tzu, to psychologists like Jung, and philosophers like Hegel, to contemporary entertainers like Oprah, and the more famous entrepreneurs like Elon Musk, everyone is preoccupied with leadership. Everyone seems to want to be a leader. And as your first colleague mentions, a leader needs to face changes every day, right? So John Cotter says that leadership is most fundamentally about changes. What leaders do is create the system and organizations that managers need and eventually elevate them up to a whole new level, right? They implement new ideas. They bring something new in some basic ways to take advantage of new opportunities. When you're being entrepreneurial, that is what you need to do every day. You create change, you adapt and you change some more. But as your first colleague mentioned, this is extremely hard. And this is why we as a people have a fascination with leaders. Yukel defines leadership as the process of influencing others to understand and agree about what needs to be done and how to do it. And the process of facilitating individual or collective efforts to accomplish shared objectives. Northhouse defines leadership as a process whereby an individual influences a group of individuals to achieve a common goal. There are thousands of definitions of leadership. And these definitions all have in common several concepts central to the phenomenon of leadership. And some of these concepts are leadership is a process. Leadership involves influencing others. Leadership happens within a context or a group. Leadership involves goal attainment. And these goals are shared by leaders and their people, or as our first colleague mentioned, their followers. The very act of defining leadership as a process suggests that leadership is not a characteristic or a trait uh, with which only a few gifted people are endowed with at birth. Um, defining leadership as a process means that leadership is a transactional event that happens between leaders and their followers. Viewing leadership as a process means that leaders affect and are affected by their followers. Um, it, is not, it is not a linear process. It is not one-way event in which the leader just affects the followers, but it's also vice versa. So defining leadership as a process makes it available to everyone, not just a select few. More important, it means that leadership is not restricted to just one person in the group who has been appointed as the formal leader. Leadership is also about influence, the ability to influence your subordinates, your peers, or your hierarchical bosses in a work or organizational context. Our first colleague mentions he works uh, with some people. He wants to influence them in terms of their punctuality, in terms of how they do their work. Um, without influence, it's impossible to be a leader. And leadership operates in groups. It means that leader is about influencing a group of people who are engaged, as I mentioned, in this common goal. Uh, this can be a small center for management development in a business school with, say, a staff of four. Or it could be a naval ship uh, with, a company, with, uh, with 300 people or a multinational enterprise such as Starbucks. So leadership can occur in various types of groups. Now, this definition of leadership precludes the inclusion of leadership training programs that teach people to lead themselves, right? So therefore, leadership is about directing a group of people towards the accomplishment of a task or the reaching of an endpoint through various ethical-based means. 
Leaders direct their energies and the energies of their followers to the achievement of something together. But leaders are willing to expend the time and effort in determining appropriate goals uh, which will make them work together. And for me, leadership is to be the way. And I think both of your colleagues alluded to this. When you are the way, when you are responsible for setting the vision for the people, you also have to model the behavior and you have to ensure that everyone follows the path. Now, we need to direct our attention about leadership theory in brief. So from the domain of IT, military, psychology, we have some new style of leadership popping up every year, right? Shama has mentioned there are many types of leadership. So we now hear things like super leadership, strategic leadership, systems leadership, and the list goes on and on. But the first great debate of leadership was the nature versus nurture. The prevalent question was if leaders were born or made. And while we cannot give a final answer on the dilemma, I can tell you this. It is way better for you to believe that leaders are made. Now, why is that? Because when you believe the leaders are made, you will employ a set of actions to better your situation because you can do something about it. When you think that leaders are born, that makes you a fatalist and you start having a fatalist account on life. You don't want to do as much because you feel you don't have the same opportunities. But for a long time, actually, we used to think that leaders were born. The most popular leadership theory in the 19th century was the great man theory. Thomas Carlyle had an imperative influence on the great man theory of leadership, as he proposed that the world is constructed to the biographies of great men. According to Carlyle, effective leaders are gifted with divine inspiration and a set of right characteristics. This perspective is contingent on the mythological standpoint of leaders as heroes. Being in the presence of great men was perceived as an honor and an invaluable experience for acquiring worth ethic skills and knowledge. But then, trade theory emerged through the works of Francis Galton. The trait theory proposes that there are inherent qualities and traits that make individuals better suited to the position of leadership. Statements such as, she's a born leader, or he was born to lead, imply a perspective towards leadership that is trait-based. Yukal states that the trait approach emphasizes leaders, emphasizes leaders' attributes such as personality, motives, values, and skills. Underlying this approach was the assumption that some people are natural leaders, endowed with certain traits not uh, possessed by other people, the, not possessed by commoners like us. And this is very different from describing leadership as a process. So in essence, the trait viewpoint suggests that leadership is inherent in a few select people and that leadership is restricted to only those people who have special talents with which they are born. And some examples of traits are the ability to speak well, an extroverted personality, or even unique physical characteristics. And in the mid 20th century, the trait approach was challenged by research that questioned the universality of leadership traits. In a major review, Stonghill suggested that no consistent set of traits differentiated leaders from non-leaders across a variety of situations. An individual with leadership traits who was a leader in one situation may not be a leader in another situation. So the idea of context or situation to leadership emerged. And nevertheless, the trait approach has earned now new interest in the media to the current emphasis given by many researchers to visionary and charismatic leadership. And in a study to determine what distinguished charismatic leaders from others, researchers found that charismatic leaders constantly possess traits such as self-monitoring, engagement in impression management, motivation to attain social power, and motivation to attain self-actualization. So in short, the trait approach is live and well. 
It began with an emphasis on identifying the qualities of great persons, shifted to include the impact of situations on leadership, and currently has shifted back to re-emphasize the critical role of traits in effective leadership. Many finding later, a list of 10 characteristics were associated with leaders. And these are drive for responsibility and task completion, vigor and persistence in pursuit of goals, risk taking and originality in problem solving, drive to exercise initiative in social situations, self-confidence and a sense of personal authority and personal identity, willingness to accept consequences of decisions and action, readiness to absorb interpersonal stress, willingness to tolerate frustration and delay, ability to influence other people's behavior, and capacity to structure social interaction systems to the purpose at hand. Now, whichever way we look at it, it is unequivocally clear that leaders are not like other people, conclude Kirkpatrick and Locke. And the three major traits that seem to be emphasized today are intelligence, self-confidence, and determination. Unlike traits that are largely fixed, we shift our thinking to an emphasis on skills and abilities that can be learned and developed. So Robert Katz attempted to transcend the trait problem by addressing leadership as a set of skills that you can develop. And the three skill approach includes technical, human and conceptual skills. So I'll say that again, technical, human and conceptual skills. It is important for leaders to have all three skills, but depending on where they are in the manager's structure, one skill will be more important than others. And now I want to think about yourselves and where you see yourselves in your future career. Which is one skill from the tree that you need to develop and why? So according to the skill approach, I'll say that again, we have technical, human and conceptual skills and according to where you envision yourself in the future what is one skill that you need to develop and why if someone wants to take the microphone to share with me and the rest of your colleagues Yes, I can hear you well. And your name is? Azim. Nice to meet you. Please yeah, share with us. Um, what is the question again? So, we've talked about a brief history of how we used to think about leadership. First, we used to think that some leaders were born to be leaders. Then we started thinking that there are certain traits that leaders need to have in order to be leaders. And now we've realized in research that there are three skills that leaders need to develop in order to be leaders. And those skills are technical skills, there are social skills, and there are conceptual skills. And the question is, considering where you want to be in the future, what skill is it most important for you to develop and why? Um, okay, for, for me, I think three of the skill is important, but um, you have to know like each, each one well in, 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 in it to use it for planning and 
uh, to lead your people. So um, the social one also um, important. It's just like even though you are working in in the I mean you are uh, managing the organization, but the social outside in, uh, outside the company also important because that is show like how your company look like, how the uh, society look into your company, and it also attract the customer by that. That in my opinion. Are you currently an entrepreneur? Sorry? Are you currently in any capacity an entrepreneur? Uh, yeah, I did some of it, but just a small one. And what is it that you did? Um, I work in some um, consulting company and then I uh, do a small uh, online business for myself. Okay, and where do you see yourself in the future? Um, of course, I, I take entrepreneurship uh, major, I will be a printed, yeah, entrepreneur in the future. So, nowadays in leadership literature, we think that leadership can be learned and it is observable to what leaders do and how they behave. Now, a different view on leadership is assigned versus emergent leadership. Assigned leadership is the appointment of people to formal positions of authority within an organization. Emergent leadership is the exercise of leadership by one group member because of the manner in which other group members react to him or her. Examples of assigned leadership are general managers of sports teams, vice presidents of various groups, plant managers, CEOs, and executive directors of, say, non-profit organizations. And in some settings, it is possible that the person assigned to a formal leadership position may not be the person to whom others in the group look for leadership. Emergent leadership is exhibited when others perceive a person to be the most influential member of the group or organization, regardless of the person's assigned formal position. Emergent leadership is exercised when other people in the organization support, accept, and encourage that person's behavior. This way of leading does not occur when a person is appointed to a formal position, but emerges over time to positive communication behaviors. And Fisher suggested that some communication behaviors, so you might want to write this down since a couple of you mentioned they want to improve their communication skills, um, our verbal involvement, keeping the team well informed, asking other group members for their opinions, being firm but not rigid, and come up with new and compelling ideas. Now, of course, we cannot talk about leadership without discussing power. The concept of power is related to leadership because it is part of the influence process. Power is the capacity or potential to influence. People have power when they have the ability to affect others' beliefs, attitudes, and courses of action. Judges, doctors, coaches, and teachers are all examples of people who have the potential to influence us. When they do, they are using their power, the resource they draw on, to exchange change in us. But nowadays, we're experiencing a shift in leadership power, which is moving towards followers. And Stanley mentioned this in the beginnings, this concept of followership. Leaders matter greatly, says Robert Kelly. But in searching so zealously for better leaders, we tend to lose sight of those people these leaders will lead. Who will leaders lead? Have you ever considered the other side of the coin? The followers. So what, or better yet, who are followers? A textbook definition would say followership is a process whereby an individual or individuals accept the influence of others to accomplish a common goal. Followership involves a power differential between the follower and the leader. And typically, followers comply with the directions and wishes of leaders. They defer to the leader's power. So who are these people? 
Who are these followers we're talking about? If you are the boss, they are your employees. By the way, now in leadership communication, we don't use the, the word boss anymore. If you are a project manager, they are the team. If you are a professor, they may be your assistants or a close group of your students. Followers do not have an official title, but they are the ones the leaders are influencing. Followers get the job done. They work in the organization's mission. They support leaders. They can challenge leaders. And they definitely should learn from leaders. And there are different classification of followers, usually according to engagement or interest. Kelly's typology is currently the most recognized followership typology um, in the literature. And he classifies followers as passive followers, sometimes called sheep, don't use that word, uh, who look to the leader for direction and motivation, conformist followers who are yes people, always on the leader's side, but still looking to the leader for direction and guidance. Alienated followers who think for themselves and exhibit a lot of negative energy. Pragmatics who are fence sitters, who support the status quo, but do not get on board until others do. And exemplary followers, sometimes we call them star followers, who are active and positive and offer independent constructive criticism. It is important for the future entrepreneur to recognize these different responses from their followers, to understand how to work with the teams that they build. However, there's also a reverse perspective on this. Rather than focusing on how followers are affected by leaders, it focuses on how followers impact leaders and organizational outcome. How is the leader affected by the followers? The most interesting aspect of that relationship is that in life, in all our relationships, sometimes uh, we sometimes lead and we sometimes follow. The dual leader follower relationship, says Kellerman, is this. We are all followers. Followers are us. This, of course, does not mean that all of us follow all the time. Sometimes we lead, but all of us follow some of the time. It's the human condition. So I want you now to think of a situation in your life in which you are a follower and someone else is the leader. How did you engage as a follower? Did you influence the leader? Did you give your opinion or were you just a yes man? If someone wants to share with us. Okay, uh, my name is Calvin. Nice to meet you. Okay, so uh, nice to meet you too. Um, so your question was, um, can you please uh, just uh, repeat the, the question for me, please? Yes. So we are talking about leaders and followers. Okay. Do you have an understanding of who followers are as opposed to the leader in this leader follower relationship yes, from I what do. you heard please Your pardon? who are followers what do we mean by a follower followers are the people who um who will be influenced by the the leader to achieve a certain goal Good. And have you ever been in the position of being a follower to someone? And you cannot say yes, you have... Okay, good. Can you yes. describe to us the situation and how was it for you to be a follower? Were you a yes person or maybe sometimes you tried to challenge that leader? How did that turn out? 
Okay. Uh, as they say, charity begins at home. I will talk about my my parents. They are like the leaders at, um, at home. So obviously, every time they will be like uh, trying to guide you or maybe telling you, okay, the path that you're following now is not the right one. So you should be doing, uh, you should be going this, uh, should be following this path. So um, in some instances, I I would say I used to be like, okay, like when I was young, I used to be like, yes, every time or maybe no, but most of the time it was yes or no. But as I grew up, uh, now it's like a matter of, I will be like, okay, so I might even give my opinion on how maybe I want to live my life or how I want to, or which path I want to follow. So for now, it's, it's, it's like uh, sometimes I can give my opinion and my opinion also might be heard and maybe changes might be made also. But can you give us a, a very specific answer? So a specific context. What, what was the situation and what you said? Uh, okay, maybe I will just talk about... Uh, like my family. Oh, they are, like, uh, they are very like, religious people. So me, I'm in the hospitality industry, so I've been exposed to so many things. I've been exposed to alcoholic beverages. I've been exposed to, you know, different things since I worked maybe in hotels, since I've been traveling. So uh, there is a bit of a problem when it comes to drinking, like, at home. Or maybe drinking, uh, if they know that I'm drinking, it's like a big problem. So. At first, it was like I was scared, like to talk to the to tell them that I drink. But later on, I was like, oh, I'm an adult, so now I think I can talk to them, try to make them understand. This is just uh, it's, it's a social. It's, that's my social life. So we came to a mutual agreement. I wonder, is there a situation where you've also been a leader in? in your profession or in your family setting that you've been talking about? Yeah, yes, I have been. Can you yeah, share because that? Because as, as the first born in my family, so obviously that automatically makes me a leader. So like my younger brothers, I'm the one who will be like, okay, I'll be showing them the way, like teaching them or maybe try to educate them about how life is all about so yes so you've experienced this dual role in your family setting on one hand you were the firstborn you were a leader for your brothers uh, you need to educate them but then on the other hand sometimes you're a follower for your parents yes does anyone thank you for that does anyone want to share an experience from a professional setting rather than a familiar setting. Okay. Hi. Um, so I would like to share um, an experience I had when I was working back um, back in my country. Um, I used to have a boss, like I was um, a database administrator, um, assistant database administrator, and I had a boss who was um, in charge. So um, at that period in time, he tells me things to do, like um, the product, how to put the product into the inventories and the rest. So um, it got to a certain extent. I didn't, it, I, it wasn't as if I challenged him, but I gave him an opinion, like this product code, if we are putting only the product code, it will be difficult to track a specific item. So if we are inputting the serial numbers also with the product, because all product comes with like similar numbers, but the serial number is quite different. So I um, suggested um, if we were putting the serial number and the product code, 
it will be easier to track the product and um, track the product also if the products are missing. So he, he, he was okay with the idea and we tried the idea and it, it worked out for us. So um, I've been in a um, position whereby I've been following um, and also I can also suggest, suggest to my boss if he buys the idea or not. So you've experienced personally this dual role. You've been a follower, but you've also been able to influence your boss. Yes. Good. Thank you for that. And I think this is something we should all aim to do. If we are followers, and when we are followers, we should aim to be around those bosses that allow us to give our to give our input, but we should also try to have creative ideas and to influence things for the better, as that would solidify the relationship with our bosses. Thank you. Now, since you're here and you're already at the microphone, I would like to change the discussion to the difference between leaders and managers. What is for you the difference between a leader and a manager? I think um, the difference in my own world, I think um, a leader um, is a person who passes um, information to, um, to the manager and the manager is the, I think the manager is the person who selects the job to, um, to um, his team members and tell them what exactly they need to do. So it's like, it's a kind of a tree and it has like different branches. So the, the leader is at the top and he directs the manager what to do and the manager goes down to select um, what they need to do to um, the team members and the team members execute the job and pass the information back to the manager and the manager goes back to the leader to give him the information and probably he could inspect and see what they've done so far. I think that's definitely a viable interpretation of organizations if you think of managers as individuals with the title of managers um, so that's definitely something that we see in more and more organizations right now you have the leader who is inspiring the vision driving the vision and then the managers come and does the operational side um, does someone else want to maybe share what they see are differences in between leaders and managers maybe someone from the last row that didn't get to speak up until this point. Can I, um, can I say so? Hello? Oh, please, go ahead. Okay, my name is Greg. Um, I feel um, managers, um, they focus on things, uh, while leaders, they focus on people. And uh, managers, and uh, they're more of planning, and um, when it comes to leaders, they are more into of um, inspired. And motivate. That's correct. Thank you. That's correct. Thank you. Leaders are usually the ones who inspire and motivate and when you need change to happen you usually have the leaders to do the inspiration, to do the motivation, whereas managers stick to the process and ensure that everything is done um, in order. Thank you so much. Great. From the colleague in front that is now at the microphone. Okay, uh, Ajan, my name is Festus, and from my own understanding, uh, a manager is just someone with a title, and they are only in charge of uh, making sure that a task is being done properly in a company. They just follow order from the top executive of the company and do what is required with the resources at hand to make sure that they complete a task. Why in terms of a leader, a leader has to possess some skills, unlike managers. Some managers don't need to be that skillful. But in terms of a leader, you have to have communication skills, task solving skills, problem solving skills, social skills and other skills in order to influence and motivate your followers and be a source of inspiration to them in order to complete a task. The literature would agree with most of what you've just said, but I would like to clarify that a manager does not need to not have specific skills. It's just that leaders and followers, uh, leaders and managers have different sets of skills. 
and in an organization at various times you need these different sets of skills. So leadership is similar to and different from management because as you said they both involve influencing people. They both require working with people. Both are concerned with the achievement of goals. However, leadership and management are different on more dimensions than they're similar, as you said. So, Cotter argues that organizations are overmanaged and underled. However, strong leadership with weak management is no better and may be worse. And he suggests that organizations need strong leadership and strong management. Managers are needed to handle complexity by instituting planning and budgeting, as you've said organizing and staffing and controlling and problem solving. While leaders are needed to handle change through setting a direction, aligning people and motivating and inspiring people, he argues that organizations can do both and they need leader managers. Um, and I'll finish this discussion on leaders and managers with an often quoted uh, idea from Benis and Naus, managers are the people who do things right and leaders are the people who do the right thing. And implicit to this statement is that organizations need people who do the right thing right. And of course, trying to differentiate managers from leaders is an interesting um, debacle that you'll have to face of entrepreneurs but the reality is as i was telling your colleague you need both you need both leaders and managers so in a nutshell managers are the ones who reduce risk create order plan measure control arrive at consensus create short-term specific goals and follow procedures and overall use a deductive process and while list we're all fascinated with leaders the truth is a leader without a manager will not streamline operations. And yes, leaders are the ones that increase risk, who create disorder so that order can be created afterwards. They inspire, excite and mobilize towards a larger vision. They forge commitment. They get people to comply to the change. And you need both in a company in different situation. Um, so when you need to drive change, that is when you need leaders. It's very hard to drive change that, uh, with managers. So you need both and ideally as entrepreneurs you should try and develop those very different sets of skills. But even more importantly you need to identify when one skill set should be used and when the other skill set should be used. And I would like in the end to focus on self-leadership. But because we're all entrepreneurs who are becoming entrepreneurs now here, I will ask you if you want to continue and talk about self-leadership or if you want to ask questions or if we should stop our session now. So Dr. Voravi, I'll let you decide that with the glass and get back to me. I think that uh, uh, now, uh, if you have any uh, Q&A session, you can ask uh, Professor Farida. So, if you have any question, if not question, we will have to uh, thank you, Professor, uh, for up to you. So, everyone, what, what do you, can I say? Uh -huh. Any question? No? 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 Okay. Okay, everyone is fine. Okay. So, if everyone is fine, I, uh, I can let, let the list, so we will have Oh, yes, yes, thank you. Uh, one question first, and then we uh, say thank you to Costa, and then we take a photo together. Yes, please. Yes, we can. Okay. okay. Um, my question is, so as um, an entrepreneur, right, what um, are the qualities you think are the qualities you need to have to make you outstanding? It's always a question about becoming outstanding. It's never a question about becoming uh, consistent. So this is the first thing. Entrepreneurship is about consistency. It's not one thing that you can do 
to that will make you blow up overnight it's what you do every day um, I would say you have to cultivate self-leadership so the ability to lead yourself the ability to not be demotivated when things don't go your way and the way to do that is first of all you need to find a model of behavior a, a mentor an inspiring leader you work with or for someone who has the habits and the knowledge you desire to learn um, because you need to know and understand how those great entrepreneurs those outstanding entrepreneurs think and that is something that is achieved by looking at people who do that and then you need to switch extrinsic motivation to intrinsic motivation extrinsic motivation is when we're motivated from outside so in school we're motivated to get good grades or we're motivated because our parents want us to want us to be star students extrinsic intrinsic motivation is when the motivation comes from inside it comes from within us and that's something that i would say you need to cultivate because the truth is an entrepreneurial journey is really hard and you will want as most entrepreneurs will tell you in their memoirs will want to quit almost every day so you need to infuse meaning in the small actions that you do every day to keep you going it takes longer uh, than we think that would be my um, answer to your question focus less on being outstanding thank you, thank you and more on con consistency thank you